Hi, I'm Jane Hutchin, and in July 2010, I created One Plus One, and up until September 2019, recorded nearly 500 interviews. In this series, I'm bringing together my top 10. They're the conversations which have taken me by surprise or somehow had an impact on me. I hope you enjoyed this interview with singer and musician Rick Springfield. Rick Springfield, I want to start off by asking you, when were you at your happiest? I was seven years old and I lived in, was living in Broad Meadows. My dad, it was an army camp. My dad was a major in the army. And um, summer, uh, that summer, I used to get up uh, and help the milkman, which, who still had a horse and cart, and delivered glass bottles. A little, a little army camp, it was like a loop, of about 30 houses, 40 houses. I'd go around with the milkman like five in the morning which I wouldn't dream of letting my <laughs> kids do now. Uh, he'd give me a little, you know, the quarter pint milk. I'd chug that and then I'd uh, grab my dog and I'd go around to every house and pick up everybody's dog. And it was a quarry about half a mile away from our house and I'd run them all down to the quarry and then take them all back and then go in and have breakfast. And that was the, the best time of my life. But times are good for you now, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean they're great now. I'm very, I, I, I try and stay very grateful because uh, I have a, a passenger that rides with me 24/7 that uh, doesn't think very much of me. We'll talk about that passenger in a moment, but let's talk a little bit about the film that you're appearing in at the moment. You play the role of Greg. You're a musician. You are Meryl Streep, who is the rock singer Ricky Rendazzo's love interest. Mm -hmm. And you're really kind of like, um, I mean, if you had a critical inner voice, you're kind of like Ricky or Merrill's positive, positive voice. inner yeah, voice, Greg, aren't you? Greg's a very, is a, a, he's a, got the biggest heart, I think, in the movie. And, uh, you know, it's written like that. Um, and I think that's why Diablo Cody, the writer, wrote him in, because uh, everybody has, has an element that kind of go, ooh. Even Meryl's character is, there's some, there's some very unsympathetic moments, uh, which is what human beings are like. Is that it? It doesn't matter if your kids love you or not. It's not their job to love you, it's your job to love them. And, That's um, why you were put here. I think she wrote Greg in as a kind of the good guy, you know? I mean, he really is a good guy. And, um, my wife actually likes Greg better than she likes me, which... <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> I can be Greg. <laughs> that part wasn't written for you. No. How no, did no. it find you? Uh, it was just an audition. You know, they were... Jonathan Demi wanted um, uh, the music played live. He'd, he'd shot, besides doing Philadelphia and Silence of the Lambs and all these incredible movies, he'd also shot Stop Making Sense, the Talking Heads movie. He'd shot a bunch of documentaries with Neil Young. So he knew what live music looked like on camera, and it didn't look like lip syncing, which 99.9% .9 of the movies that have performances in them are lip sync. That's just the way they do it. So he wanted to play live. So he, um, and Greg, the character, is supposed to be a pretty good guitar player. It's actually mentioned that he's, you know, a pretty good player. So he needed someone who could shred to a degree and also work in the acting field and uh, and, he, and had to have a great chemistry with Merrill. So it was a, probably a fairly difficult role to cast. A lot of great actors came, went up for it. And then uh, when it came time to actually do the guitar, they, you know, they had to say, oh, I don't really play that well. Because actors always lie about that kind of stuff. I've done it myself, you know. Can you, can you water ski? Yeah, I've been water skiing since I was 10 years old. Um, so the first audition was a guitar thing, her singing with a band, a house up in the Hollywood Hills. And I, um, I brought the character in because I knew what the character was supposed to be and played with her and uh, did a couple of songs and they apparently, I guess, liked the, the chemistry. 
in the role, you aren't like a, a larger than life character on stage. Was that all, all characters in movies are larger than life? But you're not overtaking Ricky or mm -hmm. Meryl. You you were sort of like this person off to the side and actually at the beginning of the film she, she puts you down a bit mm. on stage. And she's very mean to, to Greg at times uh, which I think endears him to people because he doesn't fight back and bite her head off. He takes it and then deals with it. You know it, it confronts her but he's uh, unfortunately I'm the kind of guy that someone says something to me I jump right back. And, really? And, I, and it could be you know, it, it drives my wife out of her mind if we're in public and something goes down. She hates that. And I just, it's just a reaction in me. But Greg doesn't have that. And that's why he's a good guy and why I'm a jerk. <laughs> You've said that every actor I know secretly wants to be a musician. Why do you say that? I know a lot of actors and they all do something else because you have to as an actor. Unless you're Meryl Streep and you go from movie to movie to movie to movie, every actor has a lot of downtime. And um, I knew Gary Sinise for a while, he used to be a neighbor, and he was a bass player. And all he wanted to do was play bass. He just happened to fall into the acting thing and, and scored very big. And, um, and everybody has like the inner rock star. I mean, everybody was 14 years old and watching their favorite band and going, that is so freaking awesome. And me too, I mean, I remember sitting in the crowd at Festival Hall watching the Beatles and going, I want that. You know, everybody does. It's just a, it, it seems like the best gig in the world. It's not, but it, because it's like anything, you know, there's, it's a hard road. But um, everybody kind of harbors that dream. I mean, no, not everybody says, you know, I, I really want to sell stock. <laughs> that's, been, that's everybody's dream, right? Don't you want to be a stockbroker? You know, I mean, everybody wants to be a rock star. Um, not everyone wants to be, everybody goes, that'd be freaking awesome, that must be so great. I, and there is great elements to it, but there's great elements to every career. And, and so that's what happened to you? You saw the Beatles and you decided that was going to be your path? Yeah, well I actually fell in love with the guitar when I was 12 years old. I was, we'd moved to England, my dad got shipped over to England, which was the end of my good times, because I said seven was the last time I was uh, truly happy, it was because before we were shipped over to England. and I held the guitar for the first time in my life and just fell in love. I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. This before girls were interesting to me. So it was, they pre, guitar predates girls. You mentioned a little earlier that you spent really your formative years in Australia pretty much until the age of 21, albeit with a couple of years over in the UK. Your dad moved around a lot because he was in the army and you went to so many schools. Do you think that made you a restless person or was that a byproduct? No, I was definitely, it, 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 it was good and, good and bad like everything in life. It was uh, very, a tor I was very tormented by it as a kid, you know, and always being the new kid in school every two years. And, um, but it gave me a love of traveling. I love to travel now, absolutely love it. Um, and it's, and it, I know it taught me that I can overcome stuff because every t every school, I turned it around. I didn't realize I was doing that, but every school, I made friends eventually with some kids and had a great time and loved it and and cried when I you know had to leave. So I I, I saw that uh, the bad times wouldn't be forever, and it happened again and again and again and again. It wasn't a matter of it just happening once. It happened every two years. I had to turn it around every two years. I and it was you know. It was tough. I had to leave my dog here. I, was, well, I had to have a major dog scar because uh, when we went to England when I was nine years old, Dad said, we're going to England. And I burst into tears and said, what about Elvis? Elvis was my, my first dog. And, um, and I still remember tying him up at my friend Colin's house and walking away and knowing I'd never see him again. And he was howling and scarred me for a long time. <laughs> scarred me forever. Yeah, you're a real doggy person. Mm -hmm. You were also extremely fond of your parents, Eileen and Norman, and they're real role models to you. I wonder, what was it when you were 17? You tried to commit suicide. Why was that, given a lot of love around you? I was staying home from school a lot, um, because I, A, because I felt I just couldn't go to school. It was a depression thing. You know, and depression landed on me when I hit puberty. And I started to feel really ugly and, and unworthy and 
didn't have a lot of friends, really alienated at school. This is my last school. This is uh, Ashwood High was my last school. And, uh, and so mom and I would have battles every morning because I didn't want to go to school. She had to go to work. And uh, so there's probably the biggest distance between us was that, that time. My dad was always the peace. If, if anyone's like Greg, it's my dad. He was all, he'd call up, he was the army officer, but he was always call up at home and see if I was okay. And, um, but I just felt really awful and uh, hated myself. And, and I was home one morning and I just, I felt absolutely hopeless. You know, I, I knew I was failing and the only thing that I had a chance to succeed at at that point in my life, which was school, and I knew I was failing and, and that I, it wasn't going to end well. So I just, one morning, I just grabbed a rope and went out, made a noose and tied it around the beam in the garden shed and got up on a box and kicked it away. And it happened so fast. It was almost like punching the wall. It was that kind of thing, like, you know, grabbed me. And, and, and it, I didn't think about it. I didn't think, you know what, I'm going to hang myself. I just took me over. And uh, I hung there for about 20 seconds and was just starting to kind of, things were starting to spin and uh, ended up on the floor. And the, the ropes, I don't know, I still don't know what happened. And, you know, I, do, I don't think God was going, we're going to save this lad because he's wonderful. I think it was just happened, you know. Could have very easily gone the other way. And I got, had a rope burn around my neck for about three weeks and um, didn't try that again. <laughs> Did God play a big part in your life when you were young? Yeah, yeah. I was raised, you know, kind of almost Catholic. It was Church of England, which is like Catholic with a little less guilt. But my, um, I got the wrong message at church. I got the message that, um, but I, I absolutely believed in God and, and prayed that I would, that he would stay with me and help me in my career and bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And, but uh, I, the message I got from church, the churches I attended was, uh, keep your head low or you will, God will cut it off. If something good happens, get down on your knees and say, thank you, Jesus. And that really messed with me because um, my mom was telling me how wonderful God was and I'm going, that doesn't sound wonderful. But I did believe in the love of God and I think I just thought he must be a pretty cantankerous dude to, or woman. Um, to want to beat me when I f***ed up. Um, and I had, a, you know, I have crucifixes, crosses all over my house. I have all these old, you know, from 12th century. I, only, I love the image of the cross. Uh, yeah, so I, I, th I grew up thinking, I, I ended up thinking God was a punishing God, but, but was there for me. And when my dad died, I prayed heavily to God and, and lent very heavily on my, on my view of God. Because um, your dad, in a way, had two deaths, didn't he? Because he was very ill and he had the heart attack and then he was resuscitated and he came back a completely different man. I think you described him like a five-year-old when he yeah, came back. Yeah, that was pretty brutal. That was the first uh, really giant heartache I've ever... We, we were also, you know, in a house in Parkdale. I was, I guess, 20. And uh, we got a call in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning. He'd gone in because he'd passed out. I was with him, actually, the day he passed out. He had a lot of stomach issues, and he passed out. And, and uh, they put him in the hospital to see what was going on. So found that he had an artery, uh, a hernia on his artery in his stomach, the major artery in his stomach. And in the middle of the night, it burst, and he lost all his blood and, uh, and died. And um, so we got the call. And uh, basically he was dead for like 15 minutes. And they brought him back and they in the, we got to the hospital and they said this significant brain damage, we don't know how much till he comes around. It's very hard for you to talk about this. Shall we move on? No, it's okay. My way of honoring my dad. So, um, and basically he came back and 
we had to teach him who his friends were again. And um, I still, the song, the, I have a piece of paper that I wrote, Speak to the Sky on. And on the flip side is my dad learning to write again. It's a pretty precious piece of paper. That was an incredible thing that all of your family did to get your dad back on track, even though he wasn't the same man no, we, that he we, used to be. I, we sat with him and, you know, it, it, it was stressful at times, you know, because he'd been this in charge, loving guy, and he was still very loving, but uh, he knew something had happened, and he didn't quite know what a, he didn't know what it was, but he knew something had happened to him, and I felt pain for him. Do you get reminded of him, especially when you come back to Australia and you see your mum? And yeah. Let's move on to happier things. Happier things. No, I love my dad. It was you know. Yeah, it's been fun. You hit the big time. Well, you became a musician at a very young age. You must have had an insight into a lot of different types of, of human nature. There would have been a lot of people um, who wanted to have fun with you. You talk in your book about the amount of sex and drugs you had. There were also a lot of people who wanted to use you, who wanted to make money off you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that in your life you've had a good opportunity to have a look at human nature? Oh yeah, very much so. I think I think also. I mean, we all do. We all, you know, can connect or disconnect from humanity in whatever way we think it serves us. But um, being having depression causes you to look inward a lot, and and so you become very conscious of what you're feeling, which is great for a writer. I mean, you stay in longer than than most people than people without depression. I think you stay in a lot longer. That's why a lot of artists. I, don't call myself an artist, but that's what a lot of artists do. They do have issues with, with their self-worth, and, and uh, that's why they look in. And that's what creates a different view of a familiar subject. Like, you know, um, I remember reading Jackson Brown, listening to Jackson Brown songs when I was a, a young guy, and, and hearing a phrase and going, that's exactly what I feel. He could put it in one one line, and I always wanted to do that. I thought that was really powerful stuff. And looking in is how you form, not necessarily an original view, but you get a perspective that maybe people who don't look in as much, you know, do. But it's, it's a, it comes at a cost. You said a minute ago that you don't call yourself an artist, but many people, particularly in this country, the country that you left, maybe haven't seen the whole spread of your career and what is the dominant feature which is perseverance you know you taught yourself well you went I'm to a acting. Very, I'm a very pig-headed guy. But you learnt acting you got a role on General Hospital whether you know you or other people appreciate that or not you no, were a persistent songwriter you wrote songs you're still writing songs you're about to re release your 18th album do you see that you have a gift? I think my gift is is perseverance for sure. I've always known that I have to keep going, and uh, if I if I give up, then then the story's over. You know, um, I think I have a a gift for a, a certain gift for for melody, and you know, um, I, I really I've just put in I, a lot of it's just putting in the work. Um, I certainly. Would, I'm a better actor than I was in General Hospital. I was pretty god awful in General Hospital looking at it. So I've learned, I've worked with the craft, and uh, and that's. I think you get certain gifts. I don't really. I, Mr. D won't let me uh, say what my, if I think I have any gifts, but I think I, I, uh, I have a, I have a, I know a, a, a good overview um, of where I think the world is and where I fit into it. You talk about Mr. D, so this is the darkness, this is the, the person who's usually with you and is pretty good at bringing you down. Mm -hmm. Where is Mr. D now? Is he still around? Yeah, he's sitting right there behind you. So in all the work you've done and all the reading and there's been therapy and you've married a wonderful woman, you have two amazing sons. That's Mis a highlight. Mr. D hasn't disappeared? No, because uh, that was... What I said in my autobiography, actually, the big realization, the lie of fame, 
that uh, I always, part of my drive and my persistence came from the fact that I've got to, I've got to make it because then I will be well. And, uh, and I was for a couple of years, you know, when Jesse's girl first hit and, and getting all the attention on General Hospital and people telling me I'm great and all this kind of stuff. And it, it worked for a couple of years, but that's just distraction. That's just like someone going, look over here, look over here, look over here. And I had a, a big house in Malibu and w was wealthy, uh, had platinum records that I'd always wanted, and I was the most miserable I'd ever been in my life. And I, I realized, uh, and that was, and it made it doubly, doubly uh, p painful because I thought that would heal me, and I suddenly realized that wasn't going to fix me. And so not only had depression come back, but then. I realized that, you know, no matter what I did, it was still going to be there. Um, it was a great realization because um, now I don't hope for that. <laughs> but, I can, but I still love what I do and I still go after my dreams and I still have a lot of dreams and a lot of goals, but I know it's not going to heal me. Um, because, you know, no matter how much money you got or, or how successful you are or or whatever, it's still, there's still the alone moments, you know, that, you know, that uh, you can't get past. So when you say none of these things have healed you, is there a solution or is it? Yeah, the, well, no, there's not a solution. It's, it's a life sentence. It's not like doing heroin and going to, to uh, I, I, I don't mean that lightly, but, um, and going to rehab and coming out and say, I'm a new man. Uh, I, you know, when I got the movie, Ricky and the Flash, it lifted me, you know, and I was, yeah. But, you know, a little later, I look in the mirror and Mr. D would say, you're gonna really f this up, you know that, right? Um, so, it, but you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, certainly don't mean that I, to be like a sad sack about it because I know I'm very fortunate and I'm very thankful. I have an amazing family. I have great people in my life. Um, I'm doing something that I love, but uh, at times, you know, it pulls me down, and that's, uh, you know, I know a lot of people with depression. I'm not, I'm not the only one. Let's talk about something a bit funny. Depression is pretty funny. Is Depends it? Depends which way you look at it. Doesn't seem funny to me. I actually me. wrote a very funny screenplay about Mr. D. And you wrote a novel which was sort of about, well, a self-help book and someone finding God's telephone number, but... I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that while you were in General Hospital, you took a flight and they needed a doctor on the plane. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, the height of Noah Drake fame in Dr. General Noah Hospital Drake. and I was flying to New York and uh, this, they announced over the loudspeakers, there a doctor on the plane, obviously somebody was sick and everybody turned around and looked at me and I went, it's, it's acting. <laughs> I'm not really a doctor. Someone's sick back there. It was pretty funny. I've heard that you collect memorabilia, like Titanic memorabilia. What's yes, that about? I, I have a geek collection. Um, I have actually my best friend that I met when I was 14 here, John, John Kennedy, who I'm still friends with. He's still the most, the be most beautiful guy I've ever known. Real, uh, we started play had our first bands together. He's a Titanic freak too. And we also, we talk, we have so many similar interests, but um, I have uh, the lifeboat plaque from lifeboat number two that was the first one picked up by the Carpathia. It says SS Titanic. There wasn't very much stuff on the Titanic that had the word Titanic on it because it all had white stars because they didn't inter interchange it, you know. But um, I had the lifeboat plaque and uh, it's pretty cool knowing that that went down the side of the Titanic as it was sinking and saw it all happening. Uh, I love history, but certainly the Titanic is one of those things that if it grabs you, it grabs you hard. Um, I have a very good Star Wars toy collection, which actually there are, uh, the guys from Train came over, in the band Train came over to my house to do a podcast, and uh, one of them had heard about my Star Wars collection, and, he's a, and when you meet a fellow Star Wars geek, it's incredible, and I show, I have some like, figures where that are all there's like one or two of them in the world you know that kind of stuff and he wanted he, i laid them out in the bed and he said I'm, i just want to take my clothes off and rub myself all over these 
because a geek is a geek, and it's pretty awesome when you meet one. Rick, what kind of conversations are you going to have with your sons, or what kind of conversations have you had about the amazing span of your life, but also things that you've done, the suicide, the drugs, the women? Mm. How do you talk to your sons about I, that? I don't, because they're really actually not that interested in my life, and I, they're interested in their own life. I, I talk, I have, my sons have, my eldest, we have very brutally honest conversations. I mean, I took, pulled the plug in my career in 1985 when my first son was born so I could be with them and help raise them. And uh, so I have a great relationship with them, very honest, and uh, we connected because uh, to a degree I was, there, there was a coolness to me amongst their friends because I was a musician and, um, and this generation definitely is, is, has more in common with their kids. My fam, my parents were really like the other, the older guys, the older generation. I know a lot of kids that, a lot of mutual interests with their parents, you know. But um, I, I, I help them when they have issues and they come to me very honestly and, uh, and I think that's, that's a gift. I really don't take that for granted. But they're not interested in my life. <laughs> Except my youngest son, Josh, did work on the movie. So you mean they've never asked you about some of the stuff you had in the book? They've never asked no, you they about read your my suicide book. Would, My wife never read my book. She said, I don't need to read it. I lived it. <laughs> the director of the film that you're in, Jonathan Demme, said everyone has a past they wish they can change. Hmm? Does that apply to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of things that I'm... Uh, that I would go back and redo. Really? A lot of choices I would, uh, not, not, not career-wise, just person-wise, person person-to-person. Person. I've not always been my best self, you know, and, um, you know, I wouldn't change anything in my career because, of, uh, well, I would. I mean, it'd be fun to see what else would happen if I, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have some personal regrets for sure. So what is Rick Springfield's best self? Mm, I don't know. Give him a couple of glasses of wine, sit him down around his, uh, the, the center block in his kitchen and let him talk to his wife while she's making dinner when the kids are coming over in an hour. That's my best self. Rick Springfield, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with me on One Plus One. Enjoyed it. Most of it, except for that guy. And that's one of my top ten. Thanks for watching. You can watch again on iView. See you next time.